All right, let's, why don't we get started at seven o'clock? And unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we don't have anyone on Zoom watching at home, but we are recording and we'll make that uh, recording available to them after the fact. So thank you to those of you who are here tonight. Uh, I'm Lori Poacher, I'm the VP of your County Audubon. Um, before we get to tonight's program, just a couple of events that your county has, that YCA has coming up. Whoops, wrong way. We practice this for hours. There we go. Okay. So first up is our 2023 Birding Challenge. And this year, this weekend, actually, we'll be out trying to see as many birds as possible in a 24-hour period. That is our challenge. Um, and this year, we're fundraising on behalf of the Maine Young Birders Club, which was founded by York County Audubon in 2016. So we're looking to raise money to support the club's efforts, expand our membership, hopefully to do a better job reaching underserved communities. So we'd like to invite everyone here to donate if you haven't. Uh, if you want to aim your phone at that QR code, there's also a couple of sheets in the back uh, that you can take home that'll take you to the website if you want to do an online donation. And just a reminder that no donation is too small. Literally every dollar helps. We're closing in on our on our fundraising goal, we're looking to raise $5,000 and we're at about 4,300 as of today. Um, what else? Uh, our weekly bird walks, the bi-weekly bird walks are back. So they started last week. So they will resume on May 27th and then run every other Saturday through August 5th. Those are right here at La Ronde Farm, 7.30 in the morning, but space is limited and uh, pre-registration is required. So I will direct you to yorkcountyaudubon.org for details and to, read, uh, to register for that. And then on May 20th, next Saturday, uh, the Beach Plum Farm Eco Fest is being held. That's in Agunquit, right downtown, just north of downtown um, at Beach Plum Farm. And we will be participating there. That should be a fun event. And again, there's more details on our website. Um, and then in June, our next program is on Tuesday, June 20th. That is at 7 p.m. right here. There is no Zoom streaming for that program. That's live in person only. And pre-registration again is re required. That one's called Birds of Prey, Our Talented Friends, very punny title, that's being presented by the Center for Wildlife and they're bringing some of their wildlife ambassadors along. So that's always a fun program. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, CFW has treated over 50,000 injured and orphaned wild animals and presented programming to thousands and thousands of community members over the years. So should be a great program, definitely family friendly. So head on over to yourcountyaudubon.org to sign up for that. Um, that program is also gonna be preceded by our brief annual meeting on June 20th. At that meeting, we'll be seeking our members approval for our slate of officers and directors, um, as well as our revised bylaws. So again, details can be found at yourcountyaudubon.org. We encourage everyone to take a look and give us any feedback you have. Um, that's enough for me. So let's get to tonight's program. Um, we are delighted to have Anna Siegel with us tonight. Anna is a climate justice activist, a high school student, and an active member of Maine Young Birders Club. Uh, she's also the advocacy director of Maine Youth Action, a core member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice, and serves on her town's climate action task force. But she's here tonight as the outreach lead for the 30 year bird project, which is working to answer the question of what role Maine's nearly 10 million acres of commercial forest can play in conservation. So without further ado, here is Anna. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to be here. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are doing this work on Wabanaki land and all the work that the 30 Year Bird Project uh, has been doing is on Wabanaki land and so is York County Audubon. Um, and so there will also be a question period at the end of this presentation. So if you, so same questions for the end would be excellent. But I, thank you for the lovely introduction, um, where I also just want to introduce myself a little bit more. So I am a high school student. I go to Wayne Fleet School in Portland, uh, and I live in the greater Portland area. And I am both very interested in birds and climate. And those two things come together in 30 Year Bird Project, looking at how the abundance and diversity of birds in Northern Maine is affected by forestry. But because two separate studies were conducted 30 years ago and in the 2020s, so like 2020, 2021, 2022, then it's 
climate change obviously changed Maine and those forests in that 30 year period and forest practices also changed. So how has all this affected birds? What does this mean for conservation? What does this mean for ecology? That's what we're trying to find out. I got involved in this project because of one of the principal investigators who's listed here. Uh, this little list is uh, the principal investigators, the two field crew leads for the 2020 um, project, which we'll talk about more later, and myself. I was contacted by a PhD ecologist, Dr. John Hagen. He said, hey, Anna, it is rare to find a high school student who wants to be a conservation ornithologist. Are you interested in helping out with this study? And I said, yes, please. So he invited me to spend a week up there, five hours north, the last two hours being on just dirt roads, middle of nowhere, um, in this logging area, and to sleep in some old logging camping vans and wake up at 4 a.m. to look at birds. It was awesome. <laughs> and so that was I two, that was what I did for a week two summers ago. And that was basically just a field trip. I was just kind of like helping out with the plant surveys and things like that. And then last summer, um, he asked me to do that, more work as the outreach lead and to kind of dig in a little bit because the research is for undergraduates and graduate students, uh, but he created this opportunity for me to create presentations like this and write articles. Uh, and so that's why I'm here today. If you are interested in kind of taking this home with you beyond the recording of the presentation, which will be made available uh, the October issue of Maine Magazine also has an article written by myself about the 30 year bird project. Um, and that is the Mainers of the year issue. So it's a it's one that a lot of people have um, because that is a looked forward to addition. All right. So that's a little introduction, who I am, how I got involved. Uh, and I also just wanted to flag that my involvement in this is due to integration generational collaboration. That is something that is so unique about this project. Not only has it spanned 30 years from 1990s to the 2020s, but also spanned many generations. High school student myself, the undergrad and graduate students, and then the older folks, the principal investigators, who were the original field crew 30 years ago. All right, so the 30-year bird project. Why start this 30 years ago? Because the reasons that the project occurred 30 years ago, and I say today, even though the, the research part is over, but referring to the 2020s section, I'm going to say today, um, why it started 30 years ago was for a few reasons. One is the big New England hole. If you look at maps of Maine, you'll see that there's an area where there's pretty much nothing. It's really cool, and it's pretty unique in this area where you'll throw these highways, and then there's a big blank space. That is these 10 million acres of logging forest. And people were wondering what happens up there? What lives there? What breeds there? And who's using that area? And what does productivity look like? And then clear cutting was a big issue in the 1990s. There was a lot of talk about clear cutting. Were they biological deserts? Is this safe? Is this something that we should be doing? This picture is a place called Ragamuff Clear Cut. And pictures like this, people found really, really alarming. Um, and then also in the 1990s was uh, spruce budworm outbreaks, which also changed the ecology of the region and also prompted more questions about what was going on up here. And so this is what, why this was started. And this is the big hole that I was referring to. So you can see that there is a highway coming down from the left from Canada, one that goes across to Bangor and then one that goes up and then cuts off into New Brunswick. And then above that, is the hole. There's not much. Um, in the pin, Ragamuff Road, is where that logging camp I referred to was. Those, are those little logging houses that we stayed in. They're on the Golden Road, which is a place where they take the logging trucks. It is covered in shale. It destroys trucks. Be very careful if you decide to go birding up there. Uh, the Golden Road is a little treacherous. Um, but so the massive clear cuts in the 1980s were due to a budworm outbreak. They needed to cut down as many things as possible so they could use the wood before it was destroyed by this first budworm. And so this lot of commercial forestry in Northern Maine, and there was a lot of spruce budworm, which means that there was a lot of clear cuts. And this people found really concerning. And this is really interesting because not only is it a hole in terms of roads, 
but it's also whole in terms of light and human impact. Yes, there's forestry, but something we're gonna be talking about is that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Forestry doesn't immediately mean clear cut. Clear cut doesn't immediately mean bad. But the human impact here, it's a whole with three roads, but it's also a whole with light. This is, this is a light pollution map. This is uh, photos of some of the forestry that happens. The people who are working this land are Warehouser, Landvest, uh, and Appalachian Mountain Club does some forestry as well on their lands. Um, and there's a few other companies all that we had to work with in order to do this study because we had to gain access to their land. So in partnership. This is a picture of the Golden Road that we would drive in on. And also why this study happened 30 years ago is because there were these alarming reports of massive bird declines, which almost seems like, oh, we talk about this all the time, like everything's dying. But this was part of this first wave of think of like Bill McKibben, the end of nature, like his, like one of the first books about climate change. Like people were kind of thinking about this for the first time on this grand scale and how frightening that was. And a big focus was there was this decline in birds that migrate to and from the neotropics, largely because of forestry in the Amazon. But the question was, if we could help on our end, if we, when they come here, how can we benefit them? Because they're not only in the neotropics, they're also breeding here and breeding is where we gain population. So that's super, super important. And this is this heightened conservation concern. So why replicate it 30 years later? So the original study, what the original study found is that clear cuts are not ecological deserts. It was, it was actually a really interesting and kind of contentious conclusion saying that it's not necessarily bad to have clear cuts. It's not that it's empty wasteland, it's still habitat. It's just a different kind of habitat. And it's not that we can't have clear cuts it's, not, it's just that we can't have all clear cuts, just like we can't have all old growth forest. You probably know this from anecdotes about ecology in California and Australia, but, you, but you, sometimes you need natural degradation of land like wildfires for it to be healthy. So you can't have all old growth and you can't have all clear cuts. What the original study found is that you need a healthy balance of forest in all levels of succession. And not everyone loved this conclusion because there was a lot of like anti-clear cut activism which is understandable because again, can't have everything be a clear cut, but that sort of grassland, so to speak, even though it's artificially created, supports a lot of birds, but so does old growth and so does everything in between. So that was the conclusion then. Why do this all over again? Why replicate the study and do all the point counts at 4 a.m. and hire folks and get people up to the golden road? Because the same conservation concern is still here because of the 3 billion bird report because that area of Maine, the great big hole, was marked as an IBA bird-like important, important bird and biodiversity area. Because forestry practices have changed in the last 30 years, because of climate change, everything is slightly different. And those small ripples can have massive impacts to our ecology. So the shifting forestry practices, because of that kind of anti-clear cut push, things went to partial cutting. So instead of these great swaths of land, it was lines. So like line of no trees, line of trees, line of no trees. And that didn't change how much old growth and clear cut there is. Also climate change is pushing more Northern species of trees farther north. That will change the ecology up here. So that's why we replicate the study. Why do this all over again? Um, and does, any, does anyone remember like where they were when they heard about the 3 billion birds paper? Like to me, this is a very distinct memory that it was so striking. I was on a bird walk at Freeport Wild Bird Supply and someone pulled out their phone and read a headline and the entire group sighed because we all knew it. We'd all seen every, every spring, migration isn't the way it used to be. Things aren't blooming right. You know, there isn't these sorts of insects and these aren't these sorts of birds. But this report was for climate activists an analogous report is the October, 2018, Intergovernmental Panel Climate Change Report, which talked about the threshold of emissions. Um, and it's a similar kind of, we need to take action in this way as soon as possible. And that's really what prompted the replication of this study. So trying to answer 
how foresters and landowners could change their practices to protect birds, how to unite economy and environment, conservation, corporation. So that's the great vacuum of clear cut uh, 30 years ago. And that's what it looks like now. So this is clear cutting and this is partial cutting. Again, you would say that this looks healthier and that's, you know, that could be argued, but it's, it's good to have a mix of everything. Some more comparisons. Um, so this is how things were in 1992. There was 40% younger forest, 20% mid-age forest, 40% mature forest. Now it is the complete opposite. Uh, we have very low young forest, 20%, a lot of mid-age forest, 60%, and more mature forest, uh, less mature forest, but 20%. And that is also because of shifting forestry practices, where doing less old growth cutting um, and letting things go a little more, but old growth is still disappearing and letting the mid-age things grow, it's going to flux again, likely. Like this, this will kind of just be a cycle, but this change in 30 years is quite significant. And it means that we don't quite have as many age classes as we once did because the 1992 line is flatter. And this one is a lot more sloped, which means that we're not keeping a level amount of age classes. So, so age class is a different kind of habitat if you think about that way. Some birds only want mature forest. Some birds only want younger forest. And if there's less of that, if there's less of an age class, they have less habitat. So these are the big questions that I, I was referring to. How have these bird populations changed? Looking at population maps from 1990s to now, and how can we make this into applied science? This is why this project is so interesting. This isn't gonna be a paper that disappears into an ivory tower lockbox. This is the science that could affect real policy and real change and real practices for conservation, which is super interesting and part of the reason I wanted to be involved. So here are some more comparison maps. This is the study area in the 1990s. Uh, these little squares are like segments of forest um, like that the but like the timber companies have these like stand maps uh, and stand maps show what kinds of trees are in different areas. These maps are just, they just parcel up the land into different squares. So we would say, you know, we'd head out for the morning and we'd say, okay, we're gonna visit block 4BA, um, things like that. And that's what these different blocks are. In 2020s, the study area is pretty much the same. Uh, it's just that back then there were only two big uh, corporations that they are working with, and now there's a lot more. Landvest, Weber, Bear Parks and Land, Appalachian Mountain Club, Weyerhaeuser. Uh, when I was there, I was mainly in the Weyerhaeuser lands. And then, so these are the point counts from the 1990s, and we'll talk more about what point counts are and what and what they were. And there were 387 point counts in the study 30 years ago. Mind you, point counts had to be repeated twice, so they did all these double, and then they did plant surveys at every single one. Uh, so it's a lot of work. And then these are the 2020 sample points overlaid. A lot of the points were the exact same. A lot of them were slightly different because we couldn't find all of the points exactly, um, but it's the same area. And there were actually more in the 2020s, so it got crazier. This is a stand map from 1993. So again, a stand map shows the different age classes of the forest um, and Misery Township uh, was actually, a that, that's what's represented here, was a little bit miserable. That is where some trucks continued to break down. Uh, it was also very mucky there. Um, but so this is different age classes in 1993. And then this is how it changed to 2022. So you can see that there is quite a difference in there being a lot more mid-age things and less old growth and younger. All right, so meet the field crew leads. I wasn't there for three months for multiple, for more, like a year or two. I was only there for a week uh, gathering, you know, I, I was interviewing the crew and getting materials for things like articles and like this. But Jonah Levy and Kelsey Anderson were out there leading the field crew uh, for three months, which is crazy and very cool. Um, and so they did two summers. They did one summer, it was just the two of them doing like half those point counts. 
And the next summer, there were a bunch more folks all staying in a cabin in Moosehead Lake. Uh, but both of them, um, John Levy is a PhD student at Tufts University, and Kelsey Anderson is a master's student. And they are just very cool people. I, it was such a privilege to learn from them and kind of get a glimpse into almost my future. I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. That's pretty cool. I just want to sit there and poke at plants and get really, really, really bitten by black flies. We wore bug nets, except Jonah. Jonah never wore bug nets. It was miraculous. Never. Okay, so here are methods. That, that's a photo of me the first summer I went. I, summer after freshman year? I can't remember now, but that was a very large tree. Um, so like I said, hundreds of point counts. After repeat every single one, two times, and had to go back to every single point and do a vegetation survey. So the method of a point count is you locate the point, you have to go in hundred meters from the road, and then you have to listen and record for 10 minutes of complete silence. And multiple people have to be recording in case other people miss some birds, other people get some birds, and you discuss. Uh, afterwards, you kind of say, like, I think I heard that. Did you hear that? What was that species? Maybe, and you, you do record it so that you can um, go back and argue with each other if you need to. And this is only in six weeks. You have to do all the point counts in six weeks before the birds settle down and stop singing. So you're on a timetable. You're doing a lot of them per day. You're waking up early. So I would wake up at around 3 a.m. We'd have breakfast. We'd head out, depending on how far. We'd sometimes drive for like 15 minutes, sometimes like an hour and a half in the trucks, depending on how far out we were going to different points. Uh, and then we'd have lunch at like 10 and then go out again and keep doing it and then come back, enter data, then go back out with plant surveys and then crash around 7 or 8. Um, and folks definitely had days off and had fun. Like, you know, the crew members would go swimming in the lake and play cards and it was a really fun atmosphere. But the vegetation surveys, rather than being a 50 meter point, like a bubble, they were uh, 100, like 100 meter transects. So you would take that measuring tape, run it through the area of the point and then count every single plant species along that 100 meter transect uh, and then do a bunch of other funky, fun science data stuff in terms of measuring uh, the density of the canopy, the height of the trees, and so on and so forth. And the reason that we go back to collect the vegetation data just because um, is because we can relate birds to the particular habitat. So what habitats are birds favoring? And is it certain like plant species or is it like the overall habitat? So the initial insights and results, good news, it's still 10 million acres of bird habitat. In the past 30 years, it is not an ecological desert. Uh, forestry practices changing, climate change did not get rid of birds from this landscape. Uh, we, it is still a fervent and abundant breeding ground for birds. The density of many species seems to have increased. Just there seem to be more species, individuals of a species in one area than there was 30 years ago, many species. And we don't necessarily understand why. Um, a lot of this data analysis is still going on because of uh, you know, Jonah Levy's PhD work and so on. But we did learn a lot about what different species like. So Northern Perula, any forest is fine. They're generalists. Uh, Red Iberios, they may seem like generalists more out birding, but actually they really want mature hardwood. Common yellow foats, they like clear cuts. That's probably to be expected. But black blue warblers also want mixed softwood, which also surprised me. And, and again, this is on the breeding ground. This might be different than how they behave uh, when we're just seeing them around birding more in southern Maine. But different species use different habitat types. And there are some exceptions to the densities. Some have decreased in density. These are all increases. So American red star has increased in density. Um, this line going across is average, so don't, you don't have to look at like the individual bars, but you can see the average here for American Red Star has increased. black and Blue Warbler average has increased slightly. black and Green Warbler has increased by a lot, and so has Golden Crown Kinglet, which I can attest to. Every single point count, so many Golden Crown Kinglets. Mm -hmm. So fresh. I love them. I love them. They're very frustrating when you're trying to listen to other things. Mm -hmm. Some things decreased. Magnolia warbler, which is the photo that started this presentation, and winter wren. 
pretty significantly too. Um, again, don't know why, trying to see what's going on here and whether it reflects a larger population change or an issue. So habitat change, 1990s versus the 2020s, the amount of habitat in the landscape. So the blue uh, is 1990s and the orange is 2020s. And these different codes tell you what this is. So this would be, um, you know, like hardwood, a mixture, softwood. So this is mid-age hardwood, mid-age mixture, mid-age softwood. This is mature hardwood, mid a mature mixture, mature softwood. This is regen. So regen is growing back after a clear cut. So like the bushy stuff after fires that you see in photos. Um, and then this is like clear cut CL. So you can see clear cut went down, regen went up by a ton, which makes a lot of sense. Cause if we cut back on clear cutting, then all of it's gonna start growing back. And we're gonna have all that bushy stuff. And we can, uh, see that also the mid-aged went down, but the mid-aged mixture went up and then all of the mature went down, which is not a good sign because we need to keep that age class because a lot of birds like the red-eyed vireos, really like it. So just looking at exactly these changes that have happened and putting them in these categories just for e easier visuals, youngest, medium, mature, Species density, small graph, I know, I couldn't, I couldn't finagle it to, to, to be a little easier to read. But this is just, again, looking at how the species density is overall increased. So again, blue, 1990s, orange, 2020s, so you can just see American Red Start has gone up uh, pretty much across all of, and this is putting it against the age classes, which is different about this graph. So you can see in almost all the age classes, the same ones up here. So younger stuff, mid-age, mature, uh, same grouping. So American Red Star has gone pretty much across the board. Chestnut side will be mostly increased in the young stuff, not much change in other age classes. Golden Crown Kinglet increased across all age classes, but really increased in the mature, which again, if there's less mature, but bird density is increasing, in the mature hardwoods, we really need that mature forest. So don't, this is just to show how many there are. You don't actually have to read what they are, but the, this is the list of species that increased in abundance. So 43 species increased in abundance in the study area, which is both significant and surprising. And it ranges from ruby-throated hummingbird all the way down to black hole warbler. And in the middle, there's some spruce grouse, blue jay, veery, purple finch, pileated woodpecker, and then this is looking at how many there were in the 1990s, looking at how many there were in the 2020s, and then what the number is, like what the exact change is. So Ruby Throated Hummingbird, they had a 10,000 individual increase. So if you're, and then also the abundance percentage change. So Ruby Throated Hummingbird increased by 1,128%. Uh, and this is in order of, highest percentage change to lowest. Uh, so black pole warbler, not that much. Ruby throat hummingbird, a lot. I think the one I find most interesting is spruce grouse. Um, spruce grouse had a 74% change in density. Some of this could be better detection. Maybe we know where they are, or it's easier to find them. Um, and some of that has to be worked out in like error analysis. List of species that decreased in abundance. Only 17 compared to the 43 prior. And some of them were quite a lot, like 100% change, as in we saw none in the 2020s. So no wood thrush, no Wilson's warbler, no Sharpshins hawk, no Tennessee warbler, no Philadelphia vireo. That was, that was unfortunate for me because not only was this a research trip for me, it was a birding trip. I really want to see some Philly bees. I've seen them since, but when I first visited the study, I'd never seen one. Uh, but so again, could it be detection? Could we not be hearing these birds? But if it's hundreds of points, we're visiting them twice over two summers, that's uh, pretty unlikely. Again, just kind of 
visual cue, like it's hard to decipher what this is. Abundance in the 1990s, abundance in the 20s, the change in abundance, and the percentage change. This is a this is a self-indulgent slide. I took this photo in Spruce Gross. It was my first Spruce Gross. I was really happy. Um, but I also thought that this was a fun story because I was I was after hours. So we'd done point counts for like six hours. We'd all been up for ages. Everyone was relaxing. And someone goes, Oh yeah, you know that spruce grass pair we found last week? And I was like, what? Spruce grass pair? And everyone instead of relaxing as they should after their work day, they all took me back out into the study area to show me the spruce grasses. It was super sweet and it was very cool and in, in like attestation to how dedicated the field crew were to not only their work but also birding and also showing you know I guess the next generation of birders cool things um so it was very cool it was very buggy again that was particularly bad area it was in the middle of a bog there was also a female and the male was displaying so what does this study mean where is the application so the conservation impact is what could the timberland owners be doing differently and birding impacts. So there is a side consequence to all this work we did. We also found out where all the birds are and what they are and the areas they like to live in and where they're breeding. So we also found out how you could be really good at birding up north. So there's this really interesting educational side to this study where it's now we could basically give a guide as to the best spots to see different kinds of warblers or this or that up north. We could tell people where not to go on the roads, where you're going to bust the tire, where you might be able to find lodging. And there is kind of some talk about looking to establish a birding trail um, in collaboration with Appalachian Mountain Club. And then also there will be an Appalachian Mountain Club birding festival, which will be June 15th to June 18th. And part of this birding festival is coming from the results of the study. There, uh, there will be field crew members, um, hopefully myself, I'm hoping I can go up, but also Jonah Levy will be going up to give more talks like this and also lead bird walks because no one knows better the sound of every single bird up there than Jonah Levy. Jonah Levy has done all of those point counts. Uh, so that is a great opportunity if you're like, this is super cool. But the graphs don't interest me. The picture of the spruce grass does. That, that's totally fine. You can go birding up there with Jonah Levy and with more folks at the Appalachian Mountain Club Birding Festival, which I believe is their first birding festival. Um, and so that is some next kind of cool things that will be coming out of this is real applied science and real ways to get people to engage in ecotourism in an area where it could definitely be used. Because part of this is if it turns out that what we, what timberland owners need to be doing differently is scale back it's an, that's an economic and, and environmental justice issue because that area is so reliant on timber so if we increase ecotourism through birding especially around areas like moosehead lake that'd be beneficial that's not to say that will be the outcome of the study that we're going to say you should do less forestry there aren't any like sweeping conclusions like that and there likely won't be because it's a lot more nuanced than no clear cut yes etc uh but it's definitely good to show people that there's great burden up there. And so I just want to kind of thank the various funders of this project um, and especially the Timberland owners for allowing us onto their lands. Like that is a big amount of trust, like literally giving us the key to go into their woods and look at their birds and possibly tell them things they may not want to hear. But again, don't know that yet, but it's just super interesting. Um, that we are able to do this in such a diplomatic and uh, collaborative way. So I accidentally sped through this. I talked a little bit too fast. That's okay. <laughs> that means that we can have more questions uh, and more time for things. Um, and this is also the project website. So our climate, our climatecommon.org slash project 30 year bird project. You will find all of my amazing newsletters. I learned how to use MailChimp for, for my job as outreach lead. 
I, I was working on the newsletters up there where we had no internet and I would like trying to use MailChimp and every time I do something, it would like erase my progress because there was no Wi-Fi. It was lovely. Uh, but this is the project website. You can find things like um, Jennifer Rooks actually came up to the field site and interviewed a lot of the crew members. So you can find things like that on the website. Um, but yeah, back to the Black Fed Blue Warbler. General questions or comments? Yeah. I'm wondering when you did your point count, you started at about four. How late in the day did you go before the birds quit singing? It was really wind dependent. We would often have to quit because of wind. Wind days would often hinder the progress. And that and again with that six week time period, like that was that would be a little stressful, you know, if two days were off because of wind. Uh, but generally like 9 a.m. was where we'd kind of yeah. be like, mm, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna call it mm -hmm. uh, and then we'd go back um to have second breakfast slash lunch and then uh figure out what the next point of attack was but wind was definitely an issue and there was a lot of creative ways to combat it where we would do point counts that were specifically in the leaves of certain areas. like if, if it started getting windy we'd say okay we know that the point counts on this side of the ridge will be protected or different trees sound different in the wind so we'd go to areas of fire trees things like that yeah, it was very unlikely to see. Like, we wouldn't really see birds unless, um, like, flocks of boreal chickadees coming through, or like Canada jays, or um, golden crown kinglets really high up. But we wouldn't really see warblers because they were mostly feeding as much as they could for the breeding season, very, very high up. But this study was my lifer, Canada jay, lifer, um, boreal chickadee. Uh, like the spruce grass, like there were definitely some cool bird sightings, and also northern goshawks. Significant. Um, I mentioned that we did a little bit of birding detours, like the spruce grass. We also did a birding detour both summers. I went for blackback woodpecker, and we were unsuccessful both times, but it's all right. I'll go back up. How were the trees for selecting Yeah, so like around 80 to 100 years old. Um, we went to, if, to learn more about that, the, you can look up, we went to these stands called Big Spencer and Big Reed were the ones that are significantly old. Like it was, I've never seen anything like it. Walking into Big Reed was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Um, and there's no trails either. So we were like kind of just bushwhacking very carefully because uh, it's old growth. And then just making our way along um, and finding the old, 1990s point count sites was really cool because they put like these little flags and we like would find these flags under and like pieces of pipe like pvc pipe that was stuck in the ground like underneath like layers of mulch and leaves so that's what we were doing in big Reed, but it was very it was very very cool but the definition of old growth here is very different from the definition of old growth in the neotropics i only bring this up because i was just in costa rica and it connects really well because it's the same warblers. Um, but I asked them the same question. I said, how old is your old growth? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, like, what's your definition? He was like, it's old. It's never been cut. I was like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Our definition is like, kind of like, I think, I think around like 80 to 100, but it kind of, again, depends on where you are. Um, but actually in Costa Rica, they learned that's not true necessarily. There's been new archaeological evidence of like 400 years ago of um, people in places like Osa Peninsula uh, who actually did cut trees, which is pretty interesting. Um, but not a lot of research has been done into that. Any other like general questions or comments about any of this work? This might be a little too specific. I don't know. Okay. I wonder about the, the comparisons of the ninth, the seventy, the point counts are different times for well, there was a lot more effort in the twenties, right? For those point counts. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about like the say the loop curve number. Yeah, is it controlling for that those numbers or those squad numbers? Yeah, I would I feel like I knew the answer to that at one point. Okay. Um that is so when we were uh, gonna have Zoom, um, that one of the, uh, pr the principal investigators, John uh, Hagen, was gonna be on Zoom. And my backup plan was to call on him whenever there was questions I couldn't answer. So that is definitely a that's what I would call a John question. Uh, 
And I, I, I want to say yes, because that sounds like something I have asked before, but I can also get that information for you. Um, but if there's anyone, if um, I went through the graphs quickly, because a lot of them look small, and does it, anyone want to go back to those? Feel like we moved through them too fast? Okay. Well, how did you learn the bird song? Um, on the job, I, I, I was more, I think I was more burdened than the help when I was up there, especially the first summer, the first summer I was just there because they wanted me to experience what research looked like. The second summer I was actually like working as the outreach lead. I think I did a little bit of like eBird Merlin before I went up and I was like, I'm set. And then got there and was like, no, <laughs> part of the problem is, uh, actually I can't use the six piece. It was only one species. We found it. But the white-throated sparrows there had a different dialect. And it wasn't just the ones up north. There wasn't like a northern white-throated sparrows. It was ones in specific point counts. There was a set of point counts in a certain area where the white-throated sparrows had an entirely different dialect. It was absolutely fascinating. It was the kind of thing, like questions breed questions. You know, it's the kind of thing where like you need to go back and learn more about that. Uh, it's, it's very, very cool, um, but confusing. Is there any effort to try to track down where, where they come from? Their southern habitat? It wasn't part of this study because there's so much else going on, but it would definitely be something to learn more about. From what I know of bird song and speciation, just personally, I would probably say that there was probably just one male who did something different and then you know that that worked that worked for him and then everyone and all the other males mimicked because he was the one who was getting mates and but that's just how i was always taught it conventionally but avian science always surprises us yeah no that'd be fun i i want to go i want to go out of the state for college but coming back for something like that would be super cool um especially because i want to continue doing forestry and ecology stuff i was never that into forestry before this I was into birds and I was into climate and I was into ecology generally, but I didn't think about forestry a lot. And now I can walk into the woods and be like, oh, this is 2HB, <laughs> which, is, which is kind of fun, but. That, that does connect uh, to my question. Do you guys get a species age and taking off basically? Yeah, so we would do everything at certain heights. Um, and then it was canopy density, it was tallest tree height, uh, it was the mix. So is it softwood? Is it hardwood? Um, and then it was also kind of looking at the width of trees as well to try to gauge ages, lichens, and mosses because that's a really good indicator of old growth. Uh, and then there was a lot of, I honestly cannot remember all the things we would take down during those plant surveys. It was no, no, not that I know of. Um, but that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I think we don't have any questions or comments. I think that's it. Sorry, I did this a little bit fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And recording for all. Yep.